in recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day, let us pray this prayer of land acknowledgement written by Dr. Sabrina Vaught. Please pray with me. Faithful God, we join one another today on the land and near the rivers originally in the care and protection of the Adena and Hopewell nations and the Monongahela peoples and shared over time by many indigenous nations, including the Delaware, Iroquois, and Shawnee tribes as a place of gathering and exchange. We join you also on the land and near the rivers cared for and cultivated as a site of freedom from the Underground Railroad to global uprisings for racial justice. As a process of rematriation, we acknowledge our connection to place and honor the land as a relative. Now, Lord God, guide us by your word and spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find wisdom, and in your will discover your peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. As Car Catherine stated earlier, the spirit did in move, indeed move after the bulletin was printed. And so not only was the gospel lesson changed for this morning, our Old Testament or Hebrew lesson was expanded. So I will be reading starting with the first verse of the sixth chapter of the book of Micah. Hear what the Lord has to say to us. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you endearing foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with the Lord's people and will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? And what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam's son of Beor answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. And the people asked, With what shall I come? a year old, will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And Micah replies, the Lord has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require? with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now typically every year ELPC designates October as Mission Month, a month to highlight the ways in which we support, minister to, and interact with our community both near and far, as well as a time to prayerfully grapple with what more we are called to do to walk with others. As a PCUSA Matthew 25 congregation, ELPC has vowed to work to eradicate systemic poverty, to dismantle structural racism, and to build congregational vitality by actively engaging in the world so that our faith comes alive and we work, with, work in the meantime to bring and discover and facilitate new possibilities of what it means to be a faithful community of God. Although ELPC has pledged to work in all three areas, this October the majority of our emphasis is on the work of our newest mission committee, the Facing Systemic Racism Committee. The work of this committee can be summarized as facing the systemic racism that exists inside and outside the church and to move our congregants from transactional mission and ministry to transformational mission and ministry that changes our hearts, minds, and spirits, as well as our response to people who are oppressed, marginalized, treated unjustly, inequitably, 
inequitably and unequally, and to live, breathe, and have our very being be a reflection of God's love for us. The prophet Micah's very name asks the question, who is like the Lord? And he was an unlikely spokesperson for the God of Israel. Hailing from Moresheth, a small village located southwest of Judah's capital city, Micah was sent by God to warn the people of Jerusalem and their leaders about their impending doom and demise if they failed to repent and turn back to God. Micah was greatly concerned about ordinary people. He felt great compassion for the poor and dispossessed, and he held the leaders responsible for their suffering. Leaders who place greater importance on their land holdings, their wealth, their well-being, their power and privilege rather than that of others. People much like those who are holding out in Congress not wanting to pass legislation that will provide rent assistance, subsidize child care, create jobs and cut taxes for the middle class as well as lower costs for working families, all subsidized by increased taxes on the ultra-rich. People like those who are passing legislation to gut voter rights and return to a time much like Jim Crow, disenfranchising people of color across this country. People like those who heartedly profess that white, their white body supremacy, believing in the name of Jesus, that they are inherently better than others who they deem as less than because of the color of their skin, their country of origin, religious affiliation, or class. People who profess that they are self-made successes and that people who struggle financially, socially, economically, or educationally are just not trying hard enough. All of these people of influence, affluence, and self-made success forget that it was on the very blood, backs, sweat, and lives of indigenous and first world people and people of African descent that this country and their advantages, familial wealth, and success was gained. Since 1776, nearly 1.5 billion acres of land has been stolen from Native Americans who never profess to own the land, but to be caretakers of God's creation. According to one source, from the year 1526 to 1867, 10.7 million people from Africa arrived in the Americas. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo signed on February 2, 1848, ending the Mexico-American War, ceded 55% of Mexico's territory to the United States, including parts of present-day Arizona, California, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, Nevada, and Utah. In biblical times, these occurrences are analogous to today's lesson where the rich and those with means are not only coveting, but are taking possession of land, resources, and the very lives that belong to others. Micah's warning to the people of God are similar to Isaiah's, his contemporaries, who added to the picture of a society where the rich and powerful use their influence to exploit the vulnerable and to create even greater and influence. God was not pleased then, and God is not pleased now. As Israel began to prosper economically and their political clout increased under the reigns of Kings Uzziah and Jothan, Israel began to exhibit egotistical materialism that was coupled with the maltreatment of the poor. So Micah pronounces that the people of God have caught a case using the vernacular of some caught up in the justice system. Micah rem renders God's intentions to bring a covenant lawsuit or reeb against the people of Israel. God calls on the mountains and hills as witnesses. Then God prosecutes his case by listing the benefits that God has conferred upon the people. God freed them from bondage in Egypt. God sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead them. And when King Balak sent Balaam, son of Beor, to curse them, Balaam blessed them instead and allowed them to cross over from Shittim to Gilgal on dry land. 
By the time we arrive at the sixth chapter in Micah, the earlier chapter, in the earlier chapters, God outlined the evidence against Israel. The powerful covet fields and seize them and take houses away. They tear the skin off of my people, God says. They send violence on the poor. The political leaders take bribes and the religious leaders sell out for money. Just like some people of influence think it their God-given right to rule over, disparage, diminish, or marginalize people whom they deem as lesser, or some people of affluence attempt to buy their way out to change the course of a situation, the response of the people, of, people to God's indictment and evidence is, what can we do to make this right? Will burnt offerings of year old calves suffice? Or would God be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Or be better yet, will the sacrifice of my firstborn pay for my transgressions? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is approached under the cover of darkness by the rich man who inquired what he could do to receive eternal life, noting that he had kept all of the commandments. When Jesus responded that he should sell all of his possessions and give the money to the poor, and he would have treasure in heaven, the rich man went away grieving because he just could not depart with his worldly goods and wealth. We too have trouble and grieve the very thought of giving up what we perceive to be our worldly treasures and advantages. Things like our perceived power and authority, titles, positions, and standing in the community, and yes, even our beloved financial stability and wealth. The people of Israel ask the question, what does God want from us? And Micah responds, God has already told you what is good and what the Lord requires. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Israel's redemption will not come cheap because true religion and purity of heart is costly. It may cost you some friends. It may cost you freedom. It may cost you financially. It may cost you your very life. Talk back to me, people, the millions of indigenous who were murdered, maimed, and pushed to the outskirts of society. Talk back to me, the millions of people who died on ships crossing the Middle Passage, the millions of people enslaved for hundreds of years in the United States of America. Talk back to me, the people of Mexican descent who are yet trying to enter into the land that once belonged to them. Beloved, it is not enough for us to march shouting, no justice, no peace. Real justice is transformative. It seeks to establish or, into, or to restore a community. Commentator Carol Dempsey states, God's justice is communitive and focus on, focuses on relationships between members of the community. God's justice is distributive and functions to ensure the equitable distribution of goods, benefits, and burdens of a community. God's justice is social and affects and disrupts societal order necessary for distributive justice. To love kindness goes beyond and beyond and above our familial friend or hallmark moment notions or understanding of love. To love kindness is godlike from everlasting to everlasting, unconditional, forgiving, merciful, and kind. The English language cannot and does not really define or grasp the full or complete meaning of loving kindness or the Hebrew word has said. Has said denotes and connotes affection and ethical, covenantal, and unconditional love of neighbor. To love as we are loved by God. To walk humbly with God implies reverence and openness, a sense of personal integrity, candor and honesty, a modest manner of life that is meek, unpretentious, simple, and respectful. As the people of God, we are called to godliness, to live the fullness of justice and love, demonstratively, fully, without pretense or expectation. In other words, we are called to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. 
As a Matthew 25 congregation of people on justice, on judgment day, we may well ask the Son of Man, when did we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you drink? When did we welcome you as a stranger or clothe you when you were naked? And when did we visit you when you were sick or in prison? And I might add, when did we see you oppressed and confront your oppressor? When did we see you marginalized and brought you back to the forefront? When did we see you treated unjustly because of your race, ethnicity, gender, sexual identity or orientation, ableism or age, and seek justice for you? When did we see you silenced and stand with you so that you would have the courage to speak? And when did we see you fail or fall and we rushed over to hold up your arms to encourage and support you? And the Son of Man will reply, as often as you have done justice and shown loving kindness to the least of these, in the meantime, you have walked humbly with your neighbor and with your God. Beloved, that is what God requires. May it be so, people of God. May it be so. Amen.